Street Crypto Hub, and I'm your host this morning. It is 7.03 a.m., 11.28, November 28th, 2020, and I'm broadcasting live from Leander, Texas. And um, today, we are going to go over oracles. And um, a lot of people may be asking, what is an oracle? Sounds pretty crazy. And here I am. Ta-da! All right. Uh, bright and early up this morning again as always doing my thing and um, here we go as you can see on the screen we have the fabulous Oracle from um, the matrix and then we have yours truly and then we have the logo we have Telor, Chainlink, Band and then a uh, uh, little honorable mention for gravity within the wave ecos waves ecosystem so first of all, I want to start off by saying I'm not a financial advisor. Um, don't follow my advice. I'm just a guy researching this stuff and you're going along on this journey with me researching here. I take a very macro approach. I cover the broad strokes. I'm definitely not a specialist in any of this. So if there's any details in which you see me um, saying something that's possibly inaccurate or just overgeneralizing something, um, well, overgeneralization is what I do. Um, I look at things from a top-down approach. I'm a jackass of all trades, master of none, and I'm just trying to explain to the beginners you know, kind of the, the general direction a lot of this stuff can take and not necessarily go into the minute details of everything. Um, so. If you're totally pro at this, you probably want to pass over this video. If you're getting the broad strokes, well then come on in. Let's let's uh, sit down and go over exactly what all this is here. Um, I do want to go ahead and start with the market. Let's uh, open up this Brave browser and close out this uh, intro image here. Okay, let's see here. CoinGecko. The market data suggests that uh, right now we are still in the, uh, uh, the, the little bit of a setback, but that's okay. Things are starting to pump back up. Cardano's back up. Um, Bitcoin has stayed at 17,000. It went down to about 16 and a half for a little bit. Uh, Ethereum's at 517. XRP's at 56 cents. Um, everything's doing still pretty well. Um, a lot of people may be freaking out about Bitcoin and Ethereum and everything else dropping back in price. Hey, listen, it is only natural that something should retrace a little bit after a huge pump like we had. I mean, just a couple weeks ago, we were we would have completely crapped our pants if uh, Bitcoin would have hit 15,000. You know, and Ethereum is at 500 now. It's been sitting around in the mid threes, low threes for quite a long time now. Um, so, hey, I'm pretty stoked about all this. Chainlink is at 1267. It pumped up to about, I think uh, at some point, let's see here. It pumped up to, um, it got up to about $16.15, which is great. Last July, it also pumped up to $20, but on average, it's been, uh, you know, running along a steady lately around the 12s, mid 12s. So it's right back to where it was. I, I do think there's another pump coming, not because of my excellent technical analysis, but because I see quite a bit of other uh, TA people, technical analysis people who are a lot better than me uh, at it, uh, projecting that Chainlink will do another pump. They're projecting Ethereum will do another pump. They're projecting Bitcoin is gonna do a huge pump. So. You know, I'm not going to go on my uh, prognostications, but I will go ahead and um, and tr trust what a lot of these people who seem to be a lot smarter than me at this stuff are saying. And people that I'm talking about are people like Lark Davis, the kid Donovan Jolly, Ivan on Tech, um, uh, you know, just a, a lot of others, more TA focused people. Um, there's uh, Data Dash, there's Altcoin Buzz, there's Elio Trades, all these people, they, they know what they're talking about. Um, so, uh, let me see here. Okay, first of all, we're going to talk about oracles today. So, we have the big two, Chainlink and Band Protocol. Um, so, um, then Telor is coming up. And 
those are the three main oracles and then there's something new for honorable mention which is waves and then within waves there's the gravity oracle so i will take a brief look at that at the end but first i did a whole video on chain link and then i focused on how to run a node and stuff like that a, a couple about a week ago and that was maybe about five videos back or something but uh, we are going to now focus on other aspects of it and compare it and just kind of look at the nature of what an oracle is so let's see here let's go to an article no 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 asset list i'm going to focus on that i'm going to focus on that later um there is an article that i have up here nope no nope. okay all right so i'm here i found a great article here Chainlink versus band protocol the oracle showdown um why are oracles what are oracles and what are they needed um i showed that photo of the matrix um, and let's see here. Let's take another quick look, little in, look here. There's there's the lady on the Matrix. Um, if you don't remember her, or if you've never seen the Matrix, she was the Oracle who could, uh, um, in a way, kind of through intuition, be able to understand the Matrix and what it's saying and the programming of the Matrix, and be able to uh, um, understand the fake reality that they are in and possible events that may happen through the data on the matrix and she was able to be the bridge between that that's exactly what an oracle is it is a bridge between off-chain data and the actual blockchain so um, let's see here there is a great graphic right here this is chain link right here and here's all the different things that are off-chain market data bank payments retail payments other blockchains and then a back-end system such as Salesforce uh, CRM type of stuff and SAP Microsoft SAP uh, events data such as temperature shipping logistics uh, satellite data um, and then um, locks say for instance you have a smart contract and you're a hotel owner or you're um, an apartment owner and then the person hasn't paid their bill then um, that outside information will trigger the smart contract and it will lock the door so they can't get in and then once they make the payment the smart contract will unlock the door and so no human intervention is needed this can be great or it can be scary in an Orwellian society where AI takes over so you know watch out so um, alright so then Oracle data can come from uh, web API's um, and if you don't know what an API is it is a little interface on a website that allows you to plug in information that's pretty much all it is um, market data um, such as Bloomberg stock data um, Swift for instance to do international wire transfers um, and any type of bank payment information uh, PayPal recently has been talking very good things about Chainlink and uh, you know, about integrating a lot of Chainlink stuff into its services in order to be able to transmit data to the blockchain. Chainlink PayPal also recently uh, just is allowing um, uh, cryptocurrencies as far as buying cryptocurrencies on its platform and then coming up here in January 2021 is projected to uh, um, allow payments with cryptocurrency as well so and a lot of payments to retailers um, for cryptocurrency, which is a huge step for uh, for PayPal. So uh, already we've seen a huge surge in uh, people entering the market because of PayPal, and then so and then other blockchains. Say you have um, Hyperledger and it needs to talk to Ethereum or Bitcoin or vice versa, and Chainlink can be the intermediary. So Chainlink is basically the translator. Um, it it there's a bunch of nodes which is where all the information is gathered and validated and if you have multiple nodes and then it's all put together in Chainlink and then it makes sure all the nodes and the information matches up to where it's the same and then it puts it on the blockchain to activate the smart contract and we'll get to a lot of that here in a second so let's see here um, and Ethereum when Ethereum was created in 2015 its main selling point was that it allowed the creation of smart contracts um, a smart contract is a self-executing contract. Um, these contracts allow for transactions to take place without the need of a middleman. So like about the apartment um, analogy I was using. 
Um, this is great or scary, depending on uh, the AI or who may have written the code and for what. Um, say, for instance, as well, um, the new whole COVID vaccine passports that are coming out. Um, Chainlink could be the intermediary between data that is being fed towards that smart contract. And uh, depending on that data, that smart contract could be a green light or a red light. Nobody would have to see your ID at a door if you're trying to get into a concert. Um, they would just need to see whether or not you have a green or a red light on your phone. And that depends upon the data being fed to the smart contract. The person at the door does not have to see any of your personal information. All they have to see, because that smart contract will trigger a red or a green light depending on the data coming in to that smart contract. So nobody sees your data, which is a great thing. But the bad thing is, is um, it just kind of seems a little bit Orwellian um, as far as these uh, um, mandates and what people may allow. And I'm not going to go into the whole political aspect of it, but um, pretty interesting stuff that's going on here with Chainlink acting as the intermediary and the oracle between data and the smart contract that could be completely automated. And depending on how deep the AI goes, uh, some people theorize that it could be kind of scary. Um, and it, or it could make our life extremely easy and private and secure. Um, I guess it all just depends on your outlook. So um, I'll, I'll leave that for you to decide. Um, for example, smart contracts will be set up to transfer the deed of a house from the seller to the buyer as the buyer sends their money to the contract, creating an instant and frictionless transaction instead of a process that could take months of arbitration and expensive legal fees. Yeah, so a smart contract um, will alleviate the need a lot of times for credit checks. It alleviates the need for um, all types of stuff, uh, long involved application processes. And we'll get into that with decentralized finance in a little bit. And um, since smart contracts are purely code, they have no way to interpret information and are unable to interact natively with data not found on the blockchain. Oracles are created to alleviate this bottleneck in smart contracts. And it acts as a middle layer between a blockchain and real world data. Um, a centralized oracle gets data from one company to feed to the blockchain, which although efficient, comes with inaccuracies or hacks. Um, the solution is to decentralize, to use decentralized oracles, which collect data from multiple sources called nodes, and to incentivize these oracles to provide correct data. Um, Chainlink and Band Protocol both specialize in the creation of these decentralized nodes, which allow smart contracts to cooperate with the real world and data off-chain in a trustless and decentralized manner. Okay, so let me back up for a second. Um, Band Protocol and Chainlink both use data from tons of sources and um, get that, and they they funnel that data to all these nodes, and several different nodes upload that data. They cross-check each other, and then they upload that data to the blockchain. Um, however. It didn't always, it hasn't always been this way. MakerDAO, for instance, um, I'm not sure if they started the whole Oracle feed, but um, it, MakerDAO was pretty much, uh, I believe, one of the first decentralized finance platforms. Um, so I'm going to take a quick look here um, at MakerDAO, and we will get into the compound finance Oracle hack here in a little bit. But until then, I want to talk about. Uh, the feeds, the Oracle feeds. So MakerDAO created an, an Oracle feed. And, um, okay, so let me make sure I'm on the right page here. Okay, so MakerDAO uses a single feed and uh, and it is, I guess it's a pretty good Oracle. Um, however, that got screwed up at the beginning and that's the whole reason we have Ethereum Classic now. And that's an entirely other different story. Um, so in 2017, the introduction of Psy, the Maker Foundation, released the first decentralized oracles on the Ethereum mainnet. Since then, there's been widespread organic adoption of Maker oracles, fueling the growth of the emergency DeFi ecosystem. Today, the Maker Foundation is proud to announce the next generation of decentralized oracles. So, I'm sorry, I was wrong. MakerDAO has centralized oracles. Um, feeds are critical components of the oracle system. So MakerDAO creates their own oracle and they don't necessarily use an Oracle as a service platform like Chainlink or Band Protocol. So I need to back up. I was inaccurate there for a second. Um, so let's see here. Feeds are bots. 
currently run by individuals that publish the prices and assets of assets in real time. So anything you see on CoinGecko, for instance, that's actually brought by uh, the prices are uh, brought in by Chainlink. Um, but uh, MakerDAO, they have to also um, create their own f price feeds. Oasis app. And uh, let's see here. Um, so all these prices that you see. Uh, okay, so it's making me connect a wallet. I'll go ahead and connect my MetaMask just to show. Okay. Um, so let's see here. So you can. Oh man, it's making me go through all this rigmarole. Um, so it's, it's okay. Anyway, on MakerDAO, you create a vault and you would put away some Ethereum and then you can borrow against that Ethereum. And then um, there's certain price feeds that help keep the collateralization ratio the way it needs to be. Um, so let's see here. It's making me sign this. And this is Web 3.0. Uh, web 1.0 were beginning websites. It was just somebody, the creator of the website published the data and it got published onto the website. Web 2.0 is whenever the, like the invention of Facebook, um, MySpace, people could create their own data and publish it to the website. And then now Web 3.0 is coming into play and there's these little wallets, MetaMask wallet up here in the corner, and now you're allowed to transact um, directly and anonymously without entering credit card information or anything like that um, through websites. So it's basically a little rundown which allows for things like decentralized finance to happen and uh, and then hence the need for oracles which gets the current price data um, of stuff and it allows you to um, to start doing stuff. So here uh, we have access to these decentralized finance protocols um, Oh, Lordy. Now, see, I'm finding myself going down a different type of rabbit hole. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I'll get into a lot of this later, but where MakoDAO gets its prices is from its oracles. And, um, you know, all these get de decentralized finance platforms get their prices from, from oracles, whether it be oracles as a service like Chainlink and Band or Teller or whether they create their own like MakerDAO has done. Uh, from their onset, the individuals running the feeds have been pseudonymous out of necessity. So MakerDAO, the people that actually get the pricing data and information and feed it to MakerDAO, they're uh, completely anonymous, pseudonymous, however you want to say it, uh, to protect individuals from risk of extortion and blackmail, which is good. You know, they're trying to prevent somebody from maybe being influenced by bribes and favors or by blackmail. Organizations running feeds, however, are different. Organizations are much more resilient against coercion and they have the resources to combat malicious actors and to have their reputations at stake. This makes them much, much better equipped to be feeds with public identities. It has become abundantly clear that a hybrid model is optimal, one which preserves the hardness properties of pseudonymous feeds but benefits from the reputation of stakeholders in the e ecosystem. So this kind of... Um, is lays the foundation of what proof of stake is it's it, when you stake your tokens you're helping to run a node that validates data and then as a reward you get a percentage of that stake that you've put on and uh, that's how people can make passive income and um, and there's become entire companies just centered around nothing but staking and running nodes for staking for instance, here's Stakefish, um, Secure the Network of Ethereum, and you can stake, and they created nodes and staking platforms for all these different, the band protocol right here. Um, Ethereum, that would be Ethereum 2.0, Polkadot, Cardano staking pools. Um, I know Chainlink's in there somewhere. Chainlink is involved with Stakefish. I guess it's not on the website yet. Um, we have uh, Castle Node. And um, you know, this is a company that specializes in nothing but just creating staking um, no, nodes to stake with, staking pools. Here's Course One. They do Chainlink and Band. They do Polkadot, Cosmos, uh, Celo, 
you know, a whole bunch of Solana, Kava, Secret Network, so you know, Ethereum 2.0. So these are companies that absolutely do nothing but provide staking nodes so people can upload their cryptocurrencies and earn interest off of it by strengthening the node validators and uh, providing more data to be able to cross check in order to be able to be sent to the blockchain. So this is what staking is, This is what these are what nodes are, and these are what oracles do. They take the information from that node and then they, uh, they validate them all and then send them to the blockchain. Um, uh, there's some other really good examples. Let's see here. Um, Ivan on Tech Academy has some really good stuff. I'll get into uh, what he's talking about here in collateralized debt positions, and we will be talking about that. Um, let's see here, risk liquidation of risky vaults. We'll talk about that. Um, well, we're going to talk about this Chainlink ecosystem. Um, there is one specific link I'm looking for here. Um, not that yet, and not this yet. Okay, let's. Uh, Okay, here's another staking service here, and they, they do uh, staking and all this stuff. I mean, look here, Polkadot, you'll get 13.5% rewards by staking on there. Um, let's find, there's VeChain, 15.76 interest rate. So, I mean, these are interest rates that you can't find on any banks anywhere. And um, this is the beauty of decentralized finance, is you are able to actually make an interest rate right now, bank accounts. Um, there's no more interest savings uh, with bank accounts that's gone by the wayside and a lot of countries are even having negative interest rates coming in where basically you have to pay to save your money and people don't uh, the governments don't want you to save money they want you to get your money and spend it as fast as you can and to kind of there's a word for that I can't remember the word but um, it's good for governments for you not to save and just to continually spend and they just try to feed you more money and they print more money in order for you so you will keep spending more money to keep business going and it's all just uh, thinner and thinner ice and the treadmills are running faster and faster and eventually it's going to break so if you are able to save you are empowered and um, that is the purpose of decentralized finance. Um, right now with a bank account, you're lucky if you can get 1%. That's a considered a huge interest rate. But um, when you buy cryptocurrency and you stake it on these DeFi platforms, then you're suddenly allowed to earn rewards like 13.5%. I mean, seriously, why would you mess around and save your money for 1% at best interest rate when you could turn it into cryptocurrency and stake it on a platform and even better if you're technically savvy you could run your own node and make a heck of a lot more so um you know it's it's the only downside is the risk associated with it because it's also new um, cryptocurrency is the wild west and um it's you, you got to do your research right now it's not plug and play it's not super easy quite yet i mean uh crypto wallet addresses are still these long hash numbers although there is now a service called unstoppable domains where you can change that into a domain name for instance my wallet address is eureka john dot crypto you know so if anybody wants to send me money all they got to do is type in eureka john dot crypto in the wallet id whenever they're sending money and then it'll bam it'll go to my wallet and they don't have to copy and paste some ridiculously long code or go in there and try to type it in, which is I've done both. And sometimes when you copy and paste, uh, whatever wallet address you sent to last time may still be on your dashboard and you might not have accident, you might have accidentally copied it wrong or not fully clicked it. And then it's the other address or whatever and something goes wrong and things don't get to the right address, which is what happened with domain names back in the 90s when uh, domain names were first created pets.com love.com everything.com .com, .com, .com bubble um, it's because beforehand the only people that were using the internet were typing in these these long um, addresses and these numbered addresses like ip addresses and stuff like that that made no sense and it wasn't until they were allowed to actually attach a name to cover for those addresses that the internet became palatable to the average user, which is what is happening right now in the crypto world, is these addresses are now being able to be translated into words and names that the human mind can understand, like eurekajohn.crypto. And um, 
these domain names are being bought up right now and people are, are camping on domains just like they were in the 90s and I actually have a ton of domains myself so uh, who knows maybe one day somebody will buy pressure washing dot crypto and uh, I'll make a, a, a killing off of it but until then I'm just doing what I do here so let's see here um, um, I don't need this one um, okay here in MakerDAO here are all the contract addresses for the oracles that these uh, different currencies use so for instance compound this is the oracle for that that determines the price of the compound token here's an oracle for MakerDAO that determines the price of ethereum and let's uh let's compare that real quick um let me let this load let me let it load okay ethereum here 517.95 coming from that particular oracle let's check on CoinGecko, which uses Chainlink as their oracle and this is 519.21 so there, there is a bit of a di discrepancy and uh, this is a perfect uh, arbitrage opportunity there are a lot of arbitrage bots and people do things like flash loans and stuff like that that seek these differences in price and um, they trade on that and they seek different uh, price amounts from exchange to exchange and they trade against that between each other and they make the difference between those two and uh, they do it in the real stock world as well so uh, it's just been something common and uh, and flash loans can kind of automate this and do it all on the same block so it's instantaneous so you don't even need collateral to do it so it's a pretty interesting phenomenon something fairly new that I've learned about in the past year um, I haven't done it I'm not smart enough or quick enough to do arbitrage opportunities but I do know about it and it's a really interesting subject and I will dig deeper into it and maybe one day I'll even try my own arbitrage opportunity but until then I'll just watch all the pros to it it's a uh, I wouldn't recommend getting into this stuff unless you really know what you're doing as far as that type of stuff is concerned um, so anyway let's look at the teams here um, I do have an article that kind of compares and I already started on it um, okay so Chainlink versus BAM protocol okay so uh, let's look at the history. Chainlink has a, an all-star team: Steve Ellis, Ari Jules, and Sergey Nazarov. Uh, Sergey Nazarov has basically become a celebrity in himself, um, as far as the entire crypto world. Uh, some people even postulate that he's the one that created Bitcoin and is Satoshi Nakamoto, and they try to create this paper trail to to prove that he's the one. Uh, a lot of people, you know. They, they say a bunch of different people are, are Satoshi Nakamoto, but Sergei Nazarov is a candidate along with Hal Finney amongst many others. Uh, some people have even said Elon Musk is, but that's highly doubtful. Um, anyway, uh, so Chainlink's been around a lot longer than Band. Um, Chainlink has been around since 2017. Band's been around since May of 2019. Um, Chainlink has had the time to really kind of s cement everything and uh, get it everything together um, they had their ICO band had their ICO uh, Chainlink distributed 35% of the tokens band 27.37 um, and let's see here uh, Chainlink raised 32 million band raised 10 million um, but band ICO took place on the Binance launchpad and Binance is the largest centralized exchange out there um, so it immediately gave band a boost um, some people have very many different theories and gossip about that I won't try to get into all that gossip but uh, yeah Band got a, a really good kickstart. Um, a lot of people say that Band is kind of like the Pepsi to as Chainlink is the Coke. Um, yeah, uh, or uh, yeah, Band is the Burger King, Chainlink is the McDonald's. Um, yeah, Band is kind of the underdog in a way, and Chainlink is the standard. And with all the partnerships in Chainlink, it's understandable. Chainlink has great par partnerships with like the likes of Google and Microsoft and a lot of large players out there. Um, Chainlink is basically being adopted as the Xerox of the copier world or uh, you, know, you would say I need a Xerox or in Texas if you want a soft drink you don't say I would like a pop 
or I'd like a soda or uh, anything like that. You say, I'd like a Coke. And then the waiter would be like, well, what kind of Coke you want? Oh, uh, I'll take a Sprite. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Would you like something to drink? Yeah, I'll take a Coke. Okay, what kind? Uh, yeah, Sprite, Sprite. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much a Texas thing, but it kind of tells you Chainlink is, is it, you know? And it's, I think it's going to be it. And um, there's been a lot of FUD. It's F-U-D, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt for you noobs out there. And a lot of people try to spread FUD to try to affect the price. And we'll get into that here in a second as well. Um, okay, so uh, between the two protocols, Chainlink is a clear winner here, according to this article. The team, Chainlink has Sergey Nazarov, Steve Ellis, and uh, uh, Ari Jules now. Um, but the co-founders, Steve Ellis, uh, so, so uh, Sergey Nazarov graduated from NYU. That's pretty impressive with a bachelor in philosophy and management. Um, so he, he hopped around a multitude of jobs and he got involved in the uh, cryptocurrency world and he owns the do smartcontract.com domain through his foresight uh, before Ethereum even came out, which is pretty impressive as well. Um, and Smart Contract, the company founded by Sergey Nazarov is the uh, Chainlink parent company. Steve Ellis is interesting too because he uh, worked with Nazarov as a software engineer at Pivotal Labs and there's really no information about his academic history. So I think this is really cool. I mean, I have a master's degree in theology and I have an undergraduate double major in Spanish and theology. And here I am getting into technical stuff. I, I work as a sales manager at a manufacturing plant. I'm not using my degree, however, I think those type of disciplines that I came from can kind of give me, like I said at the beginning of this video, a top-down perspective, a broad strokes perspective, a jackass of all trades, master of none perspective, uh, where I don't necessarily focus on the specific, but I can uh, um, teach and lead in a way to where I can delegate a lot of the more technical aspects to people that are very talented at that and good at what they do. Um, so look at this team here. Chainlink has a huge team. Um, Chainlink has 10 employees and seven advisors. Um, so, I mean, it's a great team, probably a whole lot of people in there with a lot of very specific talents, and that's a good thing. Um, that is more the type of team that I would probably want to lead. But then you have the band team here, and these guys here, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce this name, Sorovis Srinawakun, Srinawakun, I guess. Uh, he's the CEO. There's a bachelor's in computer science, a master's in management science and engineering from Stanford. Um, who else do we have? Uh, and he was also a member of the Forbes Asia Under 30, which is uh, super impressive and honorable. Sorowit Suryakarn, CTO, has a master's degree in. An MIT from from MIT in computer science and is a software engineer for Quora and Dropbox, and then a third co-founder is Paul Nata Patsiri. Sorry guys, um, and a chief product officer, and he has a BS in computer science from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I don't know that one, but it sounds pretty impressive. Um, and uh, he worked for TripAdvisor as a software engineer and created a crypto game with over 800,000 users. All these guys are super young. Um, there's only a few of them, but they are very impressive academically. Um, so, you know, it depends on your style, what you like, uh, what type of leadership you like. Me, I gravitate more towards large teams and liberal arts um, type of thinkers in order to delegate a lot of the more technical duties to people uh, who are really good at the minutia of what they do. These guys are more technically oriented and uh, are coming at it from a bottom-up approach, which is cool too. So maybe from a philosophy perspective, that's Plato versus Aristotle, um, if you want to get deep into that. Um, <clears throat> um, do you see the forest from above or do you see the forest from within the trees? Um, so anyway, here we go. Chainlink's network design uses event request response mechanism. Um, so uh, in order to achieve honest results, a link token, um, which is an ERC-20 token on the Ethereum blockchain, offers two incentives. It requires node depo nodes to deposit link as collateral in order to provide data. And if the data is found to be incorrect, the node has its deposit locked. Um, the second in incentive is the price set by the nodes that the smart contract has to pay in order to get data. It's a six-step process 
which is uh, uh, interesting when you kind of when you look at the the logo one two three four five six um, so it's six steps and so uh, uh, logos have symbolism and I think that's probably the symbolism behind the, the chain link node um, so let's see here uh, a smart contract asks for data states the, states the parameters such as the job for the price it's the request request is sent to the Oracle which sends it out to all the nodes the, the node best suited for the job begins to ex execute for the final steps the node sends the data to the Oracle which then sends it to the smart contract where it's used as needed um, the complex technology behind Chainlink's network is responsible for ensuring the right data is efficiently given to the requester. And BAN protocol is also a six-step process, uh, similar to Chainlink. Uh, user requests data, then or Oracle asks the validators to assemble the data. Next, the validators find the data, and the data source gives the result to the validators. And the fifth step is that the Oracle collects the data responses from the validators. And the final step can go to two different ways. Either the data collected is sufficient and returned to the user or is insufficient as a fail request. So they're very similar processes. I mean, just like literally McDonald's and Burger King. I mean, yeah. a lot of people accuse band protocol as copying Chainlink. I don't know. Um, I'm not a developer. I I'm only basic understanding of solidity and code language and this I don't even this is not even written on those languages so I couldn't tell I don't I, I wouldn't be able to look at the code but I'm sure there are people that do and I've read articles that claim that ban copied Chainlink but uh, that's for them to debate and not me um, ban holds a slightly different approach to tokenomics and tokenomics are um, everything surrounding the token the Chainlink token and the ban token and which is the reward for the staking um, so ban method allows holders to delegate tokens to a specific data provider and these data providers are the ones who accumulate data for the blockchain applications and they earn fees from the dApps of decentralized applications um, when they ask for information and block rewards from ban chain uh, ban chain is basically the node system um, so there is no set of data validators and the role is open to anyone who stakes on the protocol um, ban token as an inflationary model to incentivize users to stake tokens to increase in value and depending on how many tokens are staked the staking return on investment can range from 7 to 20 percent so those are pretty good incentives to stake on band um, i like to to invest in projects not necessarily based on um, tokenomics um, i like to see strong use cases because tokenomics and great tokenomics can very quickly fall into uh, multi-level marketing and, and Ponzi schemes when somebody's only investing on something for possible and potential return and not necessarily on fundamentals and use cases. So be careful of that slippery slope in crypto. There's tons of people trying to get you to invest in their projects for the tokenomics when it's really just a disguised multi-level marketing scheme. So be careful. Um, but I'm not accusing Banchain of being that. It, it was just a side, a side note. Um, Banchain is built on the Cosmos SDK, Software Development Kit, is what SDK stands for, um, meaning that it is a separate blockchain for Cosmos, but it shares a lot of the same characteristics, such as skate, staking, validators, and fast transactions. So that is something good that Band has going for it. It's very scalable, and it will be faster. The Ethereum blockchain right now is very popular and ubiquitous everywhere, but... Um, it has become clogged up and kind of slow so there are better blockchains out there but that being said um, that's happened in every single industry there's always something better than the standard like beta versus VHS back in the day when video um, just came out and uh, VHS won because it was more widely accepted and beta even though it was better quality video just wasn't as widely accepted and uh, here we are, everybody used VHS, and then of course now there's a, there was DVD and then Blu-ray. Blu-ray was better quality, but DVD was, was wi more widely used, and so DVD won. And now here we have, um, I think, Chainlink and Band. You know, Band may be better in some instances, and especially since it uses this Cosmos blockchain um, or SDK, and it may be better scalability and faster, but now with Ethereum 2.0 coming out, yeah, and that just came out, uh, a lot of things are gonna change for Ethereum and Ethereum is gonna be more scalable and it's gonna be faster and uh, 
what, what is band's answer to that going to be? We don't know. Um, so overall, band appears to have stronger tokenomics. The staking will take the tokens out of circular, su circulating supply, thus lowering volatility and increasing demand, which is a great strong case for band because chain link tokens are very volatile right now. Um, but we'll see. Uh, but you know, band has been volatile, but there's just not as much history on the band token as there is the chain link token. So chain link has that for it. Uh, partnerships and adoption, the more well-known and established product project Chainlink has more partnerships and connections within the blockchain sector. They have worked with almost 250 projects and are rapidly expanding their connections. Uh, some notable partners include Swift, Binance, Oracle, Intel, and Google. Um, there's a huge list of partnerships um, that can be found here. Okay, I guess the link is not there, but uh, yeah, Link Chainlink has massive partnerships. And if you go anywhere and you just check, you will find just lots of great partnerships and then uh, uh, is this no this is uh, these are a few of Chainlink's partnerships and this is an old article too so that right now there's tons of more, uh, newer partnerships that are equally as impressive um, and let's see here areas of concern uh, okay here's where the author seems to be a little more bent towards band protocol because they bring up the whole Zeus Capital controversy, and they're basically trying to point out that Chainlink has controversy and Band does not have any controversy surrounding it. What this controversy is, is Zeus Capital, and I have no idea who Zeus Capital is, and I'm not even sure anybody really has any idea it has it is, but suddenly they popped up just creating all this FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, about Chainlink, saying that it's a scam, we will not be silenced, uh, the Chainlink fraud exposed, Sergey Nazarov is just, uh, yeah, you know, some Russian in a basement uh, creating a scam in order to rug pull and a pump and dump and it's going to zero. Well, it never happened and right after this was tweeted and this whole campaign, I mean, they were doing paid tweets and paid articles and paid email blasts to everybody uh, saying what a scam Chainlink is. Well, you know what happened right after this? Chainlink went to $20. Yeah, and Chainlink is still around and going strong uh, and the author says, author says, band protocol has not had any major controversies since their release. Zeus Capital, what happened to Zeus Capital? We don't know. But that is not true. Band does have controversies. Uh, in July, we had an entire DeFi pump and craze, and then we had Yam and uh, Urine Finance, and then now we have, then we had Sushi Swap and all these food-based uh, decentralized finance platforms like. Pickle and Harvest, and you know, uh, and then we had Sushi Swap before that. And Chef Nomi is the anonymous founder of Sushi Swap. And what happened is Sushi Swap uh, was pulling all this liquidity out of Uniswap in a, what's called a vampire attack. And uh, um, it was sucking Uniswap dry, which is another decentralized protocol. But anyway, what happened is Chef Nomi, the uh, the uh, founder or CTO, CTO or CEO or whatever, CIO um, of, uh, of Sushi Swap did an entire rug pull and pulled out all the, all the money. And um, uh, basically a lot of people, it resulted in a, okay, so Chef Nomi reportedly sold his stash of tokens, which resulted in a price crash of 75%. So if you had a bunch of money on Sushi Swap, you were pretty much screwed because this anonymous um, founder uh, basically ran off with the money. And what happened is somebody connected the Band Protocol CEO or CIO, uh, Sori Suriak Suriakarn, with Sushi Swap, and he had, I guess, he was an advisor or had done an audit on Sushi Swap not too long before all this happened. And um, so there was a bunch of claims saying that Band Protocol was involved in the sushi swap shenanigans. And some people even went as far as to claim that Band Protocol was involved in the whole Zeus Capital um, uh, chain link FUD campaign. So I don't know. All this is just conjecture and speculation. But uh, my point is, is that there is controversy surrounding band as well so it's not immune to that there absolutely is zero uh projects in cryptocurrency that are immune to controversy so just keep that in mind in cryptocurrency it is the wild west let's see what time we are at okay 45 minutes i gotta speed this up okay so here's the chain link charts 
so it's doing very well that was as of august and then it went back down and then it's going back up and right now it's back at 12 something um, and the band protocol charts look somewhat similar uh chain link just has more information uh, so the, the this author concludes that chain link is probably the strongest uh one, but regardless of which project one chooses to support, the real winners are smart contracts overall that will utilize these platforms. And that is absolutely true. Um, so choose what you will. Um, and then I wanted to get in real quick about Teller. Teller is another um, Oracle platform and it's been around since 2018. So it's been around longer than Band. It just seems like a smaller Oracle, but um, Teller is interesting. Um, they take a slightly different approach to the process, um, let's see how it works. <clears throat> they uh, do data mining, proof of work within their smart contract feed. Um, so uh, the the user query does a query, then a proof of work process begins with the whole network of data providers, and they mine the data, and then the value output, and then it allows for a dispute, and then a reliable data feed can come from there. So here we go, data gets queried queries become proof of work and what happens is uh, in proof of work um, computers perform algorithmic functions and through those algorithmic functions they validate data and transactions and then they uh, they mine uh, tokens and blocks from there um, so th they mine blocks from there and then with, when they mine those blocks comes a token reward uh, for mining those. So Teller's smart contract manages the requests and issues the highest tipped queries for data, data providers to mine along with a proof of work challenge. Data providers turn proof of work into data updates. The network of staked data providers compete to mine the proof of work challenge and submit the new data updates that were requested. Official data values as a reliable on-chain price feed. Out of the first five data providers to solve proof of work and submit new data, the median value is determined by the teller contract as the official value and placed on chain. So they use an average or a median value. Um, submissions can't be disputed. Can be disputed. All data submissions are subject to being dispu disputed by token holders. Um, so let me give a, another use case. Um, let's see here. I might be able to find it real quick. Um, is used in sports betting. Um, not this one, not this one. Um, no, I've already finished with that one. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, finished with that stuff. I gotta clean some of this stuff up. Um, no, we'll go over that in a second. Anyway, a possible use case for, um, for oracles, let's say you're doing sports betting and um, you have uh, two teams and you your bet uh, consisted of one football team scoring 49 points and the other football team scoring 14 points so it's a very specific bet and then um, you have that bet go through and then you have one source and it uploads and then it uh, um, you get the payout and then it turns out oh wait no, no, they didn't count this field goal. So the score is not specifically that specific score that you predicted. And so the bet is wrong when you lost the bet, but you already collected the money. Or say for instance, you bet on the score with that field goal included. And so you won the bet, but you didn't collect the money when the contract initiated because it was depending on that one source instead of several sources. So what these decentralized um, oracles do is they wait and they get the information from several different sources they cross check them making sure that they all are the same and then they initiate the smart contract to make sure everything is accurate um, so what happens there is if if you have one feed and it is wrong then um, you're, you're, you're kind of screwed uh, so this is what happened uh, recently a decentralized finance protocol called compound uh, got a oracle hack or an oracle oracle exploit and what that means is, uh, let's say here, Oracle sees $89 million liquidated on Compound. And what happened is the coin, they relied solely on the Coinbase um, price feed. So uh, instead of using a decentralized Oracle, which it should have been using, they used the Coinbase price feed only. 
and uh, that was wrong and it pumped the price of dye up to a, a dollar thirty so thirty percent more and what happened is a lot of people's positions on uh, compound got liquidated and then they lost a bunch of money because of being liquidated and um, you know, they had to pay the difference. The arbitrage bots called the keepers came in and just completely liquidated their position. So what we'll go into here is I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, the die is a stable coin and it's pegged to the dollar. All right. And what happens is a Coinbase Oracle pushed the price of a stable coin to about a dollar thirty. So Compound was working just like it should, except for the fact that it was relying on one point. Uh, in one oracle and one price feed instead of a multitude and a decentralized price feed. So Compound gets its pricing from Coinbase Pro. Uh, now once this happened and based on built-in protocol rules, this can only mean, mean one thing, forced liquidation of the borrower's position. So somebody um, locked in a bunch of Ethereum and then, or, or DAI on the Compound platform or some other kind of token, and then they may have pulled out against that position and in these decentralized finance protocols, you can only pull out a specific amount and you have to maintain a collateralization percentage ratio. And so if you, for instance, have put in a dollar fifty, you're only allowed to pull it, pull out 50 cents. You have to keep a 150 percent uh, collateralization ratio. And if it goes below that, um, it, it, that then uh, what you say if what you pulled out suddenly increases in value if you pull out die valued at a dollar then suddenly it's valued at a dollar thirty then your collateralization ratio gets screwed up and then the keeper bots come in and they liquidate and they slash it and then they take the money that is the difference between that and send everything back to your wallet so you no longer have a position a collateralization position and if uh, that, and then you lose a bunch of money as well, and then that can screw up any other levels of leverage that you may have. And so it's pretty disastrous. And um, so this is pretty huge. And it's a strong case to use decentralized oracles and to use Chainlink as well. Now, I'm obviously bullish on Chainlink, and I, I'm, it's my favorite oracle, although I do like Teller. Um, so if a compound user borrowed the equivalent of $100 and died, then the price of the stable coin rose to $1.30. It means the bar user's borrowed amount has increased to $130. However, if the user has less than this amount in collateral, they would be considered under collateralized and compound will liquidate them. Um, so it's, it's, uh, as somebody commented, it boggles my mind that we are in late 2020 and DeFi platform forms are still vulnerable to, to, to Oracle attacks. This is why the chain link price feeds um, uses multiple sorts of information, multiple independent node operators, and multiple independent data providers. A median is then calculated. So this is the importance of decentralized oracles. So stuff like this doesn't happen. And in my sports betting analogy as well, there's plenty of other things. Um, for instance, if uh, weather data was interpreted wrong um, by only one oracle, somebody could either get a payout that they didn't need to get, or they might not get the payout uh, from the insurance claim that uh, that they should have gotten. So things like this can be disastrous when you only use one data source um, as an oracle instead of multiple data sources in a, for a decentralized oracle. Um, so let's see here. <clears throat> Somebody else decrypt. Yeah, oracle exploit sees $89 million liquidated on compound. Uh, my understanding is that the DAI price in Coinbase was driven up to a premium of around 30%. Compound's Oracle uses Coinbase for pricing data. This caused liquidations as the value of the loans exceeded collateralization ratio thresholds. He said, as far as I can tell, Compound worked exactly as it should, um, but questions will be asked about the Oracle. Uh, so, you know, Compound is a platform that lets users lend cryptocurrencies to other individuals. It is the third largest DeFi platform. Um, so let's take a quick look over here. No, no, no. At DeFi Pulse. Um, DeFi Pulse is kind of a market data uh, engine, just like CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap, but focused on DeFi protocols. So here's Maker, the, the king, wrapped B BTC. I'm going to do an entire video on this. This is a way to, to use your Bitcoin instead of just having it sit in a wallet to actually gain interest on it and to let it work for you. But we'll do a whole other thing on that. And then you have Compound and Aave here. I use Aave personally. I've never used Compound, but they're very similar where you can lock up your tokens. 
and uh, use it as collateral to borrow against it. And then you could lock, you could take that, what you've borrowed against it and lock it into another protocol and then gain interest on that and borrow against that and then use that in turn to lock into another protocol. And you have triple interest gaining all at the same time and compounding in a way. So hence the name. Or you could lock up your assets like you have a bunch of uh, Ethereum and then you can pull out DAI on that. And then you can cash out that DAI to dollars and say, you know, for instance, you have 50,000 um, or, or you have, you, let's say you have about $50,000 worth of Ethereum and uh, you could lock it up and you could, you know, pull out 10,000 and use it for a nice solid down payment on a car. And then, um, you know, you could drive away with that car with the super not having to go through a major credit check or anything like that because you're throwing down 10,000 on it um, and you, know, you could get a really good deal on that car you could pay off that car note and then you could pay off uh, what you've borrowed from the decentralized protocol at your own pace it won't affect your credit there's no credit check no lengthy application process or anything and then you can do that on your own time after you've paid off your car note, which is a very small payment because you've put down so much on a car. Or if you even have enough cryptocurrency, you could um, put it in one of these protocols and pull out enough just to buy the car all out flat together and then just pay off the, uh, on the decentralized protocol at your own, at your own uh, pace. So, and then that, all that will be earning interest instead of just sitting there and you didn't have to use that money to buy a car with, you still have that money. So it, it, it's an amazing uh, paradigm shift in the banking industry and the loan industry. This is what rich people did. And they don't let their money, rich people don't work. They let their money work for them. And now it's available to you and I, common people, plebes, um, middle-class warriors. And, uh, yeah, you, know, you can it, right now with the cost of Ethereum, it does cost a little bit as, as far as gas fees and transaction fees, but a lot of that is getting fixed. Um, and most of these DeFi platforms sit on Ethereum. See, chain Ethereum, 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 Ethereum. Ethereum. The only other one that doesn't sit on Ethereum is maybe uh, I know there's one down here somewhere. Is Lightning Network wherever that is, and that sits on Bitcoin. Um, so I don't, I'm not really sure. I don't know too much about Lightning Network. I'll probably do an entire video on that. But what happens, collateralized debt positions. Blasphemy, how can this be? How can a person get a loan without a credit history? This is on the Ivan on Tech Academy. The blockchain's answer to this quandary is collateralized debt positions. To play the money market game on the blockchain, all you have to do is put your crypto as collateral to borrow more crypto. Crypto, it is a pay to play system of smart contracts that uses collateral, mostly Ethereum, to create stable coins. Um, in, actual, in actuality, you have to over collateralize your position and have that collateral locked up in the DeFi protocol before you can borrow. And there's also a collateralization ratio involved. So if ETH price of ETH tanks and your ratio drops below a certain point, you will be under collateralized. If that happens, you'll be targeted by these nasty little bots that are constantly sniffing around like squiddies in the matrix. Their job is to liquidate your position and scarf up your collateral. That's exactly what happened on the compound protocol platform because they only used one Oracle and they didn't use Chainlink or Band or, or Teller. And uh, yeah, you know, so it's it's Compound's fault. Compound did work like it should in the code way, but as far as the management decision or the governance decision, um, not management because on DeFi platforms there is no management, there's the governance and you can get governance tokens to vote on specific issues. So the com Compound community did not vote correctly in order to vote in using a decentralized Oracle. Um, for now, just understand that DeFi, that with DeFi, an average person can access the same financial tools previously only offered through the banks. They can borrow or lend their crypto assets out and earn interest that would otherwise be an idle asset. Decentralized money markets are simply an alternative to the traditional ways the banking system has been conducting lending and borrowing for ages. Let's look at MakerDAO to see how all this works. So they go through MakerDAO. Um, Ivan on Tech is uh, really good, really informative. He's the number one YouTuber. Um, I would highly recommend looking into anything. If you read the article on decentralized money markets and MakerDAO, and you're familiar with the risk of liquidation that borrows must guard against, in compound liquidation occurs if the value of your borrowing rises above the, your level of your borrowing capacity. This can occur when a collateral asset drops in value or when the borrowed asset rises too high. 
Should that unfortunate incident occur, an, arbit an army of arbitrageurs will swoop in and liquidate your position. They do this to eliminate any risk to the protocol by repaying up to 50% of the assets you borrowed, and they will also help themselves to a portion of the collateral at the market price minus the liquidation discount. Um, the liquidation process may continue until the value of your borrowing is back down below your borrowing capacity, like the rest of the compound protocol. Uh, the liquidation process is frictionless and doesn't rely on third-party outside systems. Um, lesson being, if you decide to borrow, carefully monitor your borrow limit. So leveraging is dangerous for new people. Um, be careful. Dollar cost average in general, if you want to leverage, maybe only go one uh, level deep. Um, you can lock things in and just get the interest rate. You don't have to pull out and borrow, um, which is also cool. But if you do want to borrow, make sure that you keep within the collateralization ratio, keep on top of the prices. Um, if you're a beginner, don't borrow, uh, don't lock in things and want to borrow against things like Ethereum or a BAT token or other volatile tokens. Lock in, get, transfer your fiat currency over to something like USDC or Tether or DAI. Uh, you can buy all these on any major cryptocurrency um, exchange and then lock those in because those won't really deviate. And what happened here is people had DAI locked up and then, uh, or, or they borrowed DAI and uh, the price went haywire because of this one feed and they didn't use a decentralized Oracle. So that kind of uh, shows you a little bit about practical implications of oracles and why they are important. Um, so uh, I will close out these windows. Um, these are some of the nodes. Um, there are people that specialize in, uh, in uh, creating staking nodes in which Chainlink and Band and all that get their information from. Um, and here you can lock up your uh, Tezos, earn 10%, Polkadot up to 20%, Cardano 12%, Band Protocol 7 to 20%. So you can get some healthy rewards by locking up your, your tokens and your money in these DeFi, in these nodes, in these staking nodes. These are different from DeFi platforms. Um, so you know, Cosmos, 9% commission. Um, so they, they, these people run the nodes as a service. Here's another one, Chorus. And uh, they provide node services for band and chain link and you can stake here as well. A lot of these centralized exchanges will offer what they call staking. Basically all they're doing is going to people like this and uh, staking on Stakefish and Chorus One and stuff like that. So they're just kind of acting as an in intermediary and they take a cut. If you just want to go directly to the staking services, you can. Um, so you don't have to go through a, uh, a centralized exchange like crypto.com or Binance or Coinbase or whatever. So if you stake on one of those centralized exchanges, you're missing out on potential better rewards. Uh, here you can stake your Polkadot for 13.5%, which is amazing. Um, yeah, this is the HashCorp um, node pool, staking pool, node whatever operator. Um, so yeah, there's some really good interest rates and um, you can research a lot of that yourself. I'll try to put a lot of these links in the bottom of the uh, uh, YouTube video. Um, hit the like button or the down thumbs down video, subscribe, uh, give me some feedback, let me know what you think. I do wanna do an honorable mention over here of the Waves um, ecosystem. Uh, let's see, Waves Tech. I'm not too familiar with all this. Um, I really just looked into Waves Tech just before I started making this video. Um, but I have seen a lot of chatter on uh, Twitter about Waves and uh, it's pretty new and um, the price action has been going through the roof, which is pretty interesting. So that naturally draws a lot of people to take a look. And then I did look at the gravity portion of this. So right in Waves, there's oracles and consensus um, data oracles up here and the, there's, so there's a bunch of different aspects to the waves um, ecosystem so let's go to gravity here and gravity is a decentralized cross-chain oracle network based on a fully blockchain agnostic protocol so it can work with any blockchain well so can chain link and ban for that matter but um, um, it's a protocol for communication between blockchains in the outside world working with native do token economies 
It provides multi-purpose cross-chain interaction, but without introducing a new gravity token. So there's no token for this. The blockchain, the truly ag blockchain agnostic, no token approach creates a more inclusive open ecosystem. So where Chainlink has an ERC-20 token, and I believe Band has a token based on Cosmos, I'm not sure, but uh, um, this protocol does not use any tokens. Um, so it's truly agnostic is what they claim. Gravity empowers all elements of Waves ecosystem, but more importantly, it acts as a two-way portal between two-way portal between Waves tech and the entire open finance ecosystem. Uh, so here, truly agnostic. Gravity network is a blockchain agnostic oracle system for cross-chain communication. No token approach creates a more inclusive open ecosystem while addressing future scaling stability issues. So who knows? Maybe this could be the chain link killer. Um, but there's a whole article on it and I don't have time to go through it right now. I'm already over time. Um, I just, uh, a lot of stuff to look at here. So let's quickly look at the prices of each of these. Chainlink is 12. Well, let me refresh this page. Um, Chainlink right now is at 12.93. Let's see. Tellur is at uh, a healthy price at 24.85. And band, let's see where band is sitting at number 93 in coin market cap. It's at 584. Let's look at waves here real quick. Um, so you're not really investing in the, the waves Oracle, but the waves ecosystem, and that's at six dollars and fifty six cents. And let's see the past 30 days. Um, so yeah, it's gone from basically this, and then it shot up to 788 something and then now it's back at six something along with the rest of the market kind of falling all right well this has uh, been an interesting video i love oracles it's one of my favorite part about cryptocurrencies as i mentioned earlier i get into coins that do things um not just uh, for pure speculation because that gets frighteningly close to multi-level marketing and ponzi schemes so watch out for that type of stuff in the crypto world um Let's go ahead and cut this out, and then we will, uh, let's see here, where was I? Let's cut that out, and I will go ahead and start this media source here, and I just created this song last night, and I like it. I, I love garage band and cakewalk and all that crap. that like button and uh, you have a good day okay I will be signing out and uh, you guys enjoy life love each other and do unto others as you would have them do unto you I will talk